So let's um, let's let's get started then. Um, welcome everyone to uh, this uh, workshop at uh, the APRIGF. Um, we are going to have an hour to talk about learn from home during COVID-19. I think this is a topic that that is um, has been uh kind of a, a big topic for 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 quite some time this year in fact the whole of this year was you know the only big topic uh everywhere um what is what has been interesting um is that as we uh when 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 covid you know kind of uh, broke out um a lot of the schools of course have to um uh kind of lock down and uh, uh and students were were confined at home and then a lot we we spent a lot of time uh trying to figure out how remote working would actually work and over over the last part of last school year so generally from february or march to to june or july I see that you know we see that uh, different schools around the world trying to adapt to uh, a new normal, if you will, um, and experimenting a lot of ad hoc work. And then over the summer, um, kind of um, uh, uh, regrouped. And when when September came along and a new school year came in, uh, different schools have different strategies that they learned from the ad hoc work uh, and then deployed into kind of full production, if you will, as school, you know, restarted. Uh, and that experience, I think, is very useful for uh, for the internet governance uh, uh, community and not only from the the learning from the ad hoc reactionary uh, process and then a little bit more planned and then I think hopefully as the panelists uh, go through their the discussion uh, at towards the end one of the biggest question that I'm interested in and I think a lot of people are interested in would be, What's going to be the future? What's what's what does the future look like um, with the experience from COVID nineteen? How is education going to change uh, in in view of this? Um, and I just think about one one particular point that you know my. Uh, uh, my five-year-old kid was going through a transition from from kindergarten to grade one um, this year, and it was hugely disruptive for him. But one thing that I found really interesting is that I don't know um, that the infrastructure held up pretty well, but one thing I found really troubling is as I signed up a Zoom account or as I signed up a Google account for my kid, I have to, in front of him, lie because his age will not allow him to sign up, right? I mean, what are we teaching our kids? It's like, oops, what, I, what, how, what should I say? These are some of the challenges that are unforeseen in some cases. And, you know, these are the challenges that will continue to come. And hopefully in this, this panel, and I welcome uh, next slide, please. We have um, five uh, uh, of us here. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Um, myself and uh, Al oh, no, uh, myself and uh, Albert Wong from Hong Kong, from the Association of IT Leaders in Education. He's also a uh, a, a school teacher, and will uh, be be able to tell us a lot about the, the experience there. Um, Aris uh, Ignacio, uh, he's the Dean of the College of Information Technology at Southville uh, International School and Colleges in, in Philippines. Uh, Don Junior Roddy, um, he's a Senior Research Assistant with the UNUCS in Macau um, and works on projects related to technology policy. And then Rila uh, Gusella, uh, who, who's actually one of our NetMission.Asia program uh, ambassadors and um, is currently working on projects related to learning management systems uh, uh, in, in Jakarta. So welcome uh, everyone. And I will, um, without further ado, pass the floor to Albert. Uh, Albert will share his uh, screen with us. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Emin. Uh, I'm waiting for the rights to do the share. Okay, I can see I can have the rights. Okay, so um, good afternoon, should be here. Here's afternoon, right? So afternoon, everybody. Here's Albert Wong from Hong Kong. Um, today, my sharing topic is mainly about uh, our experience we learned from the COVID-19. So uh, my focus is on the first is about the school practices and the readiness for online lessons during the class suspension 
and the second one is uh, enlightenment from the experience that we learned during the online lesson. Okay, um, so uh, in fact, my background, I'm a computer subject teacher, but in fact, I'm a biology graduate, okay, of a local secondary school in Hong Kong, and also taking care of the school IT. Uh, another role for me is uh, the chairman of uh, association, which is called Association of IT Leaders in Education. Uh, which is an association that formed by computer and IT teachers um, of Hong Kong. Uh, of course, um, because of the post of a chairman of the ATO, and I'm the IT consultant of different primary and secondary schools in Hong Kong. And that's why today's sharing, I can share some of the experience that I gained from different schools. Okay, um, a brief description about ATO. Uh, we formed about 17 years and with so many uh, IT teachers and also computer teachers uh, from Hong Kong. Um, we are also involved in different uh, EDB, what we call the Education Bureau, uh, Examination Authority, and also different school committees, okay? Um, so um, maybe luckily or unluckily, the class suspension in Hong Kong due to COVID-19, is not the first time that we have class suspension. In fact, we experienced five days class suspension when we are in November last year. It is because of the social instability. Uh, because of some protests, etc. I think most of you have, uh, have heard from the news. So, in fact, at that period, most of the school, what they did is, because the class suspension, just like the COVID-19, is very shutting. So most of the school is just do some new announcement of the self-study work, uh, learning through the learning management system, etc. But in fact, no live lesson at that time. However, when it comes to February, we know again that the class suspension again, but this time it's because of the COVID-19. We learned a lesson before, and we know that uh, ask students to do their work by themselves is not a good arrangement. So we think that online lessons seems to be a good arrangement, and most of the school start to think about how to make online lessons. But some school using a month or even though two months time to do the thinking, okay, um, students will suffer. So uh, in fact, from uh, February, there are some different schools. They have uh, do some announcement of their teaching and learning arrangement. For example, this is from Hong Kong U. In fact, Hong Kong U already announced their online lesson, okay, starting from the uh, mid-February. And they already expected if the COVID-19 uh, lasts for a long time, then even though for the uh, online lesson will also last for a long time. Uh, this is a uh, traditional Chinese uh, news, and sorry that I can't find the English one, and so it, it will appear in Chinese, even though we, what we call the Baptist University, some uh, secondary schools, they uh, started to think about online lesson instead of face-to-face -face lesson, because we all predicted we cannot resume the lesson for in a short period of time. But for primary school, we can see that some primary school, they have live lesson in what we call the PM, or even though I know some of them, they have their um, live lesson in the evening, because just like Edmund, okay, we need to have parents besides the, the kids so that they can have online lessons, okay? Uh, some secondary schools, they have the online lesson, uh, another timetable for the online lesson, but in fact, there are some problems, and I will share afterward. So in fact, we face there are some problems of, uh, of the online lesson or even though the e-learning during the uh, class suspension period. We are talking about we select pre-record or we make a live lesson, about the timetable, which is a centralized one, um, how many versions we have, or whether it is a hybrid period. What, we, what I call a hybrid period is just like what we have now. Now in Hong Kong, uh, uh, half of the school students can go, go come back to the school for face-to-face -face lesson, but half of them need to be still online. And also about the platform that we selected and also the student involvement. I don't know whether you know what is AFK, but it is very famous in, uh, in Hong Kong e-learning. It is talking about away from keyboard because during the online learning, most of the students are present, but in fact they are AFK. Okay, so we need to check for their attendance and check for their precipitation. And also SEN, the special education need, and also about some practical works. Uh, so in Hong Kong, we're talking about the peer using peer recorded or live, it depends on the year level, whether in junior primary or you're in senior secondary, okay? Uh, about the timetable, you can see here is one of the example. In fact, the school using the normal timetable, but because for online lesson, we don't expect students to have the online lesson from eight o'clock to 12 o'clock at the very beginning. So we just select some of the lesson for them 
for example, for each week, okay, uh, each subject has one lesson or two lessons, okay, for the online lesson. So that at least the student can uh, will not lose all the all the things, okay. And about the version, I can see some of the school are uh, um, making four different versions of timetable. But however, in fact, it is a uh, it is it is it is a problem because uh, students are very hard to follow. Okay, about the platform for Hong Kong, in fact, we are using majorly for these four different platforms. Of course, Zoom, most school is using Zoom, but however, because of the security issues that it raised before, some school has changed to use the other platform. And also about the student involvement, how we check the student are AFK. In fact, what we can do is using polling or using chat so that if we find the student to not do the polling, we can assume that they are, they are what we call virtually attending the lesson, but not physically attending the lesson, okay? Um, in fact, uh, we have some other solution, like using Flipgrid, using peer tech, et cetera, but in fact, it is for high level users. Um, my final part is about the enlightenment from the experience during the online lesson. Um, because of the COVID-19, most of the school having their times for online lesson actually is less than their actual face-to-face -face lesson. And even though right now, um, the Hong Kong Education Bureau order the school to not cannot have a full day lesson, they must have half day lesson. That means that we, we can only teach with selected content. So we still start to think about that, why we need to teach whole day, okay, in the, in the past, why we need to teach whole day. If we teach half day, we can still teach students all the things we want. Why we need to have a whole day lesson? Can we spare the time in the, in the afternoon for students to do personalized learning? Uh, what we call the extracurricular activities or even do some career oriented training. So these are the sharing that I, I, I have about uh, my experience during the COVID-19. So I pass the time back to Edmund, thank you. Thank you, Albert. Um, that's the last part that I'll definitely come back to you because that's very, very interesting is looking towards in, into the future. But before that, uh, we'll go to Don um, from United Nations University uh, from Macau. What's the experience there? Don, um, you're still muted. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, actually, I was just telling Jenna that um, I moved to Manila uh, two days ago. So I was in a quarantine hotel up to this morning. So now I'm already home, um, finishing the rest of my quarantine. Um, I'm transitioning to a new role in Jakarta um, by end of the month, um, but I'll still be a part of the UN family um, moving forward. So anyway, um, a brief background about me. So I'm more or less doing research in the field of technology for sustainable development. Um, that's the focus of our institute in Macau. And one of the things that we've, uh, we are particularly interested in is in the area of um, ICT and education. Um, we don't do teaching at UNU. Uh, we mainly do policy and advisory service to other UN member states um, or other UN um, agencies, funds, and programs um, related to technology and sustainable development. So perhaps this afternoon, I'll be talking more about broad policy issues related to um, ICT and education in light of COVID-19. Um, on a more personal note, um, perhaps I'll also be talking um, about my experience um, on the flip side of, of learning um, in the times of COVID-19. And that is you know, what educators and what um, academics do aside from teaching, which is doing research, um, because we do a lot of research in our institute. Um, we also have to adjust some of the ways uh, we do research, the, how we generate knowledge um, in light of COVID-19. So I'll talk about that as well towards the end of my talk. Um, broadly speaking, I think um, Edmund and Albert provided us with the good foreground on the issues that we confront in light of COVID-19. And that is mainly disruption brought about by school closures, uh, movement restrictions, and quarantine. Um, and in, if you go to the website of UNESCO, for example, and they were tracking how many learners were affected by COVID-19, by school closures, at its peak in April, um, it was estimated that there were about 1.5 billion learners uh, who were affected by COVID-19. That represents about 90% of students worldwide in 190 um, countries across the world. The most recent data um, 
according to the tracker of UNESCO, there's about 851 million um, learners affected by COVID-19, meaning they're not able to go to um, school and you know take classes in a traditional way. Um, and this affects about 48.7% um, of enrolled learners uh, worldwide. Um, and there are about, as of yesterday, 43 countrywide closures. So across the world, there are about 43 countries where schools are totally closed and children have to either learn um, remotely, do blended learning, or other types of um, uh, learning approaches in light of um, movement and quarantine restrictions. One of the things that we found out in, in our study about um, how, how, how COVID-19 is affecting learners and, ed and education in general is what we see is that when schools transition to a more online approach, um, existing inequalities about digital access, and perhaps this is what we've been discussing in the previous days in, um, in this conference and in other um, related issues that uh, we see that um, the physical, institutional, and social infrastructure that supports um, effective engagement in um, technology-enabled solutions, um, these are not adequate in many countries. Um, it could, um, because of various limitations, there's an issue of access um, to the devices itself. There's an issue of um, learners and, and teachers themselves not equipped with the right tools to transition to these new type of um, learning. And the whole overall social infrastructure that um, supports um, an effective um, learning uh, through um, mediate technology mediated channels, these things were not present. Um, I think um, perhaps Arius will talk about this later. Um, early this year, um, Internet Society Philippines, in fact, um, wrote the piece about how um, different universities in Metro Manila, um, the challenges that they face in moving from face-to-face uh, -face learning to uh, synchronous or asynchronous um, learning um, methodology. And those has um, certain implications when you look at um, countries where, who are already challenged with when, when it comes to um, the physical infrastructure needed to have um, effective um, ICT mediated learning experience. Um, even in countries that are more advanced, so in Macau, for example, when you were talking to some of the teachers there about um, how they do online learning, uh, one of the teachers shared to us that uh, she was a bit ashamed or a bit um, um, she, she was a bit ashamed um, when she asked the students to turn on their camera, everyone, so that she can see them. You know, um, on the normal circumstances, this is, you know, um, shouldn't be very, it shouldn't be very controversial. But then uh, when one of the students turned on her camera, um, she was in a very, very small space because, in fact, you know, Macau, as you know, is a highly dense um, population. And, there, and in, in, in his household, there are three other, um, you know, uh, school-going children, um, all in a very small space, trying to fit um, and use the computers and the bandwidth, sharing the same space. So when she turned on the computer, um, the kid was a bit um, saying, I, I apologize for the messy and, you know, the very cramped space, because, um, you know, that's the only space that she got um, in order for, for her to attend this class. So the teacher thought, is it fair for me to ask students to turn on their camera in that regard, when, in fact, um, these kinds of um, inequalities, you would say, uh, would become more apparent even in an, uh, a, a, a society such as Macau, which has one of the uh, highest internet penetration rate. And all these um, uh, access and physical um, infrastructure issues are not necessarily problematic. And even um, and if you go to more um, extreme cases like in the Philippines, and perhaps, again, Aris can talk about this, you have news reports of um, students going up a tree just to connect to just to get a good Wi-Fi signal um, to send their test results. And even then, you know, um, is it fair for the teacher to put a, a time limit on when they are able to submit their test results? Because, you know, if, if, if they are unable to connect to a Wi-Fi signal and they are not able to send the report, they are unduly penalized for not being able to fulfill their requirements when in fact um, they were trying. But it's just that the physical and the whole social um, infrastructure that should support these kinds of types of learning are not yet there. So those are the things that we have to think about when we think about the future of um, uh, future or future of uh, blended learning and online learning. Um, on the things that we do, um, I'll be wrapping up quickly. On the things that we do uh, on on a personal scale, on a personal um, note, um, I'm a researcher, and 
uh, at the start of the year, uh, we had a lot of um, field work lined up up to September this year. Uh, we were supposed to go to a few countries to collect data, uh, do our KIIs, uh, key informant interviews, conduct focus group discussions. But as soon as all the borders close, unable to go to Nepal, unable to go to Sri Lanka to do our, all our field work. And so we have to adjust the way we do things, the way we collect data, and the way we do research in this regard. Um, on our own experience in one of our field work, we had to contract um, local um, knowledge experts um, and trust them that they would be able to implement the protocol that we have in terms of data collection. So these uh, new um, uncontemplated ways of using technology have to, has to be maximized. And we have to implement um, protocols online using different platforms like um, Trello boards to manage um, deliverables, um, daily check-ins, uh, which is easy for countries like, say, Philippines, where you have internet access. But if we are talking about field workers in Nepal, in rural Nepal, um, this is not as easy as, you know, telling them, let's, let's have a video call in three minutes. Uh, these have to be scheduled. We have to, um, uh, we have to set a time that this is when we will talk and that um, these are the issues that we would need because um, there are bandwidth issues. If there's, a if there's a storm in their field, we won't be able to collect um, and interact with them in, a sa in, the, in the same way that we want to. And in focus group discussion, we have to transition from you know face-to-face -face focus group discussion to an online focus group discussion. And here you lose a lot of um, you know un uncoded words. You lose a lot of the physical and um, physical and nonverbal cues that are inherent in a face-to-face -face, um, focus group discussions. Um, whether the um, quality and the kind of data that you collect as a result of the transitions that we are making because of COVID-19, they are of the same level as what we would do before COVID-19. It remains to be seen, but um, I guess the, the underlying message for all of us is that we have to adapt and it's um, um, if the previous way was unsustainable, then um, perhaps uh, moving forward, we should think about um, um, the best ways to think about um, using technology that um, take into consideration the social, physical, going back again to the social, physical, and institutional infrastructure that supports um, effective use of technology, whether in online teaching or in conducting fieldwork as a result of COVID-19. I'll end with that, and then perhaps we can discuss this um, on broader detail uh, moving forward. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Don. And uh, very interesting uh, perspective from the research and, uh, and and the protocols to use there. I haven't really thought about that. That's that's that, that's very interesting. Focus groups and stuff, and how we, you know, it's it's certainly a different kind of uh, um, situation. So how do you compare the research? That's that's really interesting. So we'll go now to, to Rilla um, and then to Eris. Uh, Rilla is, uh, I guess you have the opportunity to be on both sides as a student as well as a, a, a researcher. Rilla? Yes. Um, okay, thank you very much. So maybe, okay, my name is Rilla Gustav Mistra. I'm from Indonesia and I represent my organization, Internet Development Institute, or ID Institute, and I come from technical community. Next, uh, okay. So maybe the, two, the first two slides is about the people behind the scene. So when we talk about like online learning and so on, so on. So that's because of um, my engineer pillow and also me. So thank you very much. That's what I would like to say for the first uh, slide, two slides, thanks. So there are so many, um, so many positions in IT. So uh, as, as we know that IT is, oh, can fix, uh, can fix the mobile phone or fix something like that, fix the internet or fix a lot of things. But actually we have, uh, you know, we have a different position. So. We cannot do uh, anything actually. Like we have a, we have a different, different uh, skill, different, different things to do in IT. Next, yeah, that's the quote <laughs> on online learning and in everything. You're on mute, so yeah, no, you're on mute. Uh, thanks. Next, okay. Um, so 
first of all, uh, why I I put the some of this uh, the WhatsApp and then yeah some of so actually we know that not all of the regions is lucky to have a good connections and maybe like the remote areas and so on. So it's it have a relation with the next slide. Next, yeah, the digital infrastructure. So yeah, I, I put the some of the interview uh, from my president, Indonesian president. Yeah, COVID-19 has taught about the internet and networking infrastructures. Like it cannot be denied that support to support online learning activities must be supported by the infrastructure, like because software or even other online system or apps will not be accessible if the internet infrastructure is not yet supported. And the search of in-network traffic number is like has been striking, right? So many telecom providers like ISP and yeah, a lot of uh, kind of network companies say traffic has at least doubled like as millions of homebound users convened online and like services such as Zoom, Slack, like Teams, like like such of that apps experience record user growth, right? So um, yeah, the internet backbone is essentially like important for this, uh, this pandemic. So maybe uh, we can think about the positive impact of this COVID-19 like, oh, so the government can put effort in establishment to, uh, you know, equity of the regions to get the uh, good internet connections. Next. Yeah, that's the main, uh, not the main actually, but the famous, the famous learning management system in Indonesia. The first is Xenius Educations. Yeah, it's especially it's to help the student in this pandemic because some uh, some of the online learning it's not provide enough. So that's why uh, this platform give like discount or free free access. So basically, it's more like a practical practical tutor. So on, so it's it's really uh, it's really useful for students, especially like in high school and great uh, or university students, because the lesson is more complicated than uh, like elementary. That's why uh, this platform give the more uh, more practical practical um, like tutorial of math tutorial of um, science and so on. Next. Yes, this is what I would like to uh, say as my experience, the best practice of learn learning management system. The first is uh, actually there's a lot of points, but I put into the first is on demand, like we identify the objective because um, there are some schools that want to make their own LMS because is it to make easier in management and also um, like your demands and con your concern about data privacy, like especially for elementary school, but not limited to it because some of them still prefer to use WhatsApp, like to give information or report to parents. And which is, we can examine the risk and challenge that school face in securing their system. But uh, the main point also is uh, what I experience is to support additional subject. Like, for example, Indonesia, like we provide the religious sessions or feature before the main lesson. So basically, yeah, some of, almost the school Indonesia, we, we help like praying sessions before the school start. And the second is with the global like development of this COVID-19 outbreak, like the psychological issues which uh, accompany this pandemic have rapidly compounded its public health burden, like especially in students. So that's why uh, in Indonesia, usually there are a counseling teacher. So that's why in, in LMS, like their demands is also we provide online consultations like that. So it 
I think it's 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 really useful. So that's why um, we 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 have to listen like their demands. Next, yeah. The second is user documentation. I I know that some of like maybe the capital city uh, teacher is easy to adapt the technologies and so on. But again, in the remote areas and maybe mm, like usually they face to face, face to face learning sessions, but now it's online. So um, that's why we have to provide uh, user documentation and maybe that we can see that the user documentation is the main point, but but uh, we can do that inside the LMS. For example, like this picture, we can give the descriptions inside that. So when we hover the function, it will uh, pop up the the functions, the function descriptions, and so on. So maybe it's more related to UI or UX experience, but yeah, because the teacher maybe cannot uh, remember all of them once uh, once practice, so that's why we, we have to provide it, and it's it's really useful for you know for the engineer also because um, for example like for updates for handovers or maintenance and more. That's Rila, just a check on time. Just okay. try to wrap up soon. Next. Yeah, that's the last. Uh, this is the improvement in technology, uh, technical community. So actually, uh, in because of the the demands of ICD now it's higher and higher. So we have to improve the uh, technical community. For example, like in Indonesia, we pro uh, the Ministry of Information Communication and Technology provide the scholarship, uh, and they have a they have a partnership with official IT platforms such as Oracle, Cisco, Android, Google, and so on. And also, we can see that the Udemy, Cursor, and Allison, it's, it's the sum of the, maybe you already, you already knew this. So that's, uh, that's all for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for 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 your your thoughts on how we would could could improve this. Um, uh, and I see a very lively discussion on the the chat um, talking about um, uh, devices and the difficulty of of kids uh, actually getting their hands on the devices. But uh, I actually find it the other way around. I find it very difficult to get the device out of my five year old kids uh, hands now we just a year ago we talk about screen time limitation but now they're on the screen from 8 30 in the morning until 1 p.m so but with that i'll go to uh eris uh and uh, i'm sorry we're sort of running out of time so if you can keep this short but others please continue to, to speak over the chat and um if you have anything to share uh you can put your hand up at any time or or put your question in in the chat room we'll come back and and, and try to make this a little bit more more interactive um uh eris to you first okay uh thank you edmund uh, what is great about uh, going last is that a lot of the things have already been discussed. So <laughs> that's great for me. <laughs> but anyway, uh, as Don mentioned, uh, we at the Internet Society Philippines chapter were able to conduct a, a short survey of, uh, of all schools with regards to, not really all schools, but a couple of schools with regards to how they responded with the, with the pandemic that, was, that happened around maybe March of this year. So uh, next slide, please. Next two slides. Okay, so uh, with regards to that, there are certain approaches that we found out uh, with regards to some of the schools who have continued going into the online-based classes because some of which have uh, suspended their respective classes and just waiting for to the point that uh, we could go on face-to-face. -face. But here are some of the approaches that they have done. First, uh, uh, one is asynchronous le online learning. Another one is synchronous online learning. And the third and last one is mostly the combination of the synchronous and synchronous online learning. Next slide, please. These are some of the, the examples of how 
uh, for example, lectures were being done in a synchronous mode and an asynchronous type of learning and so on and so forth. But we're going to go into that by next slide, please. By what are the specific tools that were used by the schools? This was coming from the study itself. So these are some of the tools that are being used. The first one would be a learning management system. And funny, uh, not a lot of schools are using it, but uh, most of the schools that we were able to to gather information with is that they're using a couple of LMS. That's, for example, Moodle, uh, Google Classroom, and so on and so forth. Next, next one, uh, video conferencing. And uh, well, we are all really familiar with, with Google Meet, with Zoom, with Microsoft Teams, and Jitsi, and some other stuff. But uh, one very particular thing that we discovered is that even Facebook Messenger was used for video conferencing just to really lower as much as possible the bandwidth that is being, being gathered by these certain applications. Next one, communication platforms. Uh, with regards to those, uh, Viber, WhatsApp is being utilized uh, more than ever. Next slide. And next one. And other technology tools such as online quiz uh, making and so on and so forth. Next slide. And we discovered a lot of key challenges with regards to implementation of uh, online learning during those periods. The first one would be poor to internet to no internet connectivity at home or at location. Uh, Don has mentioned earlier that uh, in the Philippines, there are certain students who climb up trees. I will up the ante because there are a lot, as Jenna has mentioned in the chat, there are a lot of students who are going up the mountains already just to get that particular signal in order for them to be able to send their particular outputs with regards to their requirements. Next item, it's no desktop or laptop for attending because most of the students that we encountered and some of the data that we received are mostly using smartphones. And it's really difficult to create your um, uh, requirements in with regards to just using a smartphone. Next item, please. Sharing in laptops or devices at home. And last item, in a, inadequate knowledge about the digital technologies and which really needs to be taken into consideration. Next slide. And oh, the, so inadequate knowledge about methods for conducting online classes. This is a different thing. It's not really more on the student now, but more on the teacher side. Okay, next slide. So these are some non-related to technology problems in terms of the students. Can we just go on with all of the things that are there? Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, one particular thing that I would like to emphasize here is more on how depression would be part of a student with regards to them being able to conduct online classes because it's not really uh it's not really that student will just attend and uh, there are certain tendencies that the student will feel depressed if they would not be able to submit a particular requirement for example oops i timed myself <laughs> but with regards to that one that is one thing that needs to be emphasized uh, how would we be able to manage depression with regards to the students? Next slide, please. Can we also go into all of the items there? For the teachers, on the other hand, there are two items. First, uh, for them to be able to, to be trained to properly administer an online class. And another one, time management, because a lot of the teachers are used to get, used to providing or maybe uh, instructing the content in a way that they are using a face-to-face -face type of class, even though it's it's uh, an online mode type. So it's mostly on how are you going to put it in an asynchronous or a hybrid type of environment. Next slide, please. So learning the new normal. So what are those possible solutions that, uh, that can be implemented with regards to that? First slide, please. Next slide, sorry. So teaching methods and modules need to be redesigned and can we go on with all of the items there? First and foremost, we need to always look at the content wise on how we are going to transfer the one that we are doing to face to face going towards an online type of environment. And also the selection of the proper tools that needs to be used in order for you to be able to deliver the content 
properly. Also, the pacing of the lessons because the students might get overloaded in a way. So if they can get overloaded with a lot of things, with a lot of requirements, I think there should be somewhat like adjustment or maybe maybe integration of some of which. Okay, so next slide, please. Uh, implication to technology requirements. So can we go on already? Okay, so as much as possible, uh, we really need to find solutions and uh, digital literacy and digital training needs to be implemented. Well, digital inclusion is already there, but there is You seem to have lost Aris, or did I lose myself? I think, yeah, yeah his internet connection problem for him. Oh, <laughs> okay. So um, we'll come back to Aris, um, but I, 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 I was hoping to, um, what, what Aris was, was talking about is um, uh, really going towards the future. And that's why, you know, as, as he was wrapping up, and that's really the, the one big question that I, I, I'd like to, you know, pose to, 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 to the speakers. And also um, those of you uh, in the room, please feel free to, to type in the chat, but also put, put up your hand at any time. Uh, would like to share, you know, if you would like to share some of your experience and your thoughts or questions to, 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 to the panelists. Uh, but one main question I have is, what do you think is going to the education going to look like in to the future, or or research going to look like in the future after we come out of COVID? Because we've learned all these things. Do you see us going just going back to same old and you know just classroom regular and um, without any of the IT and we'll just forget all about this? Uh, or do you see a future that something in between that enhances uh, uh, the the learning experience that? that is possible uh, for the future. Any one? Albert or Dr. Yeah, I, Go. yeah, I think it depends on, depends on the government or even to the school management. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, there's a very good chance for the whole school to, to promote it to use of IT in education. But if the management uh, do not get into this chance, when everything will resume normal, then everything then will resume normal, then the China will be missed. Okay, so uh, as what my, my presentation is, in fact, we can see during the COVID-19 class suspension period, uh, most of the school only teach half days, but they still, they, 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 they can still te do the teaching. Uh, I, I, as I know, uh, someone is talking about celebrating the 100 days of class suspension, okay, for Hong Kong, okay. So for this 100 days, we already doing the, uh, uh, what we call the half day or even do several hours of teaching, then why we still need to teach for whole days when we go back to school? Can we, what we call the give back the times, give back the childhood to the students? That's what we are thinking about. But it depends on whether the management uh, uh, will looking in depth into the problem. Yeah, by sharing. Thank that, you. That's a that's a very good point. I mean, um, I guess from Don, what's what's your view in terms of because you, you also look at policy side. Um, what are the opportunities here? We, you know, we, this is a really a once in a lifetime, hopefully, uh, opportunity. We have been looking at IT for uh, education and remote learning for so many years, uh, talking about it, but this is now a real opportunity to make it happen. Right. In fact. Um... In, in these, um, you know, we look at the, um, issues like as this, like what happened in COVID-19, as a good policy window. So it's a way for us to engage policymakers um, to make sure that the changes that we want um, um, to be implemented um, will start now. And COVID-19 is accelerating um, digitization um, in terms of um, uptake of um, using technology in education, um, but there are things that um, I think would be hard to replicate in an online world. Um, speaking about what we do in research, for example, um, in the natural science, so some people have been talking about this, um, like when they go to their field, when they do their field work, for example, they visit bats in a remote island in Galapagos, and they, these field work happen once a year. There's no way that, you know, um, you can do that without visiting um, the island itself. So there are these kinds of um, strategies that happened before that will not be replaced by technology moving forward. But there are things that um, are ripe for um, efficiency improvements. Um, in fact, um, 
um, the way that um, learning is being done at the moment, um, recording sessions and students being able to refresh and look back into the recordings, I think that's a good practice that um, would be useful for learners moving forward, especially for students who may have some difficulty catching up um, lessons that were um, that were um, discussed, but they weren't able to pick up during the discussion. So, and there are also some benefits in doing online um, interaction. So people were saying that, in fact, um, some students are more interactive when, uh, especially the younger generation, the Gen Z, maybe it's the generation thing that they feel more comfortable engaging with the teachers and with their fellow students through chats rather than Facebook. And maybe that's a good thing because that's a way for them to be engaged. That's how they converse um, in, in that's how they're, they, you know, they talk to one another. They're, they're more used to that. Um, and perhaps bringing that same kind of feel into the education would be useful for them. Um, yeah, so I guess mix and what I'm saying is that it's a, you know, there are things that we can do, um, and there are also things that cannot be replicated by technology, such as, you know, doing the hard data gathering, for example. Thank, thank you, Don. And I see that Aris has um, rejoined us. Um, you just demonstrated how a student might feel when he's just trying to hand in the homework and, you know, in the just before the deadline and, and then got dropped. Um, I see you, uh, Felicia, your hand up, but I'll, I'll come to, to Aris first, uh, whether you want to wrap up what you were uh, just saying. What we were talking about uh, actually while, while you were away is what the future looks like. And I think you were going that direction as well. What could we learn from here? Uh, and would we just go back to the same old or do we see a future that can be more integrated with uh, remote learning and face-to-face -face learning? So Aris, and then I'll go to Felicia. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Edmund. Um, I think the future of, uh, of online learning will be more of a, a hybrid mode. Uh, actually, a lot of schools are right now in the Philippines are planning on going back and opening their, their doors for, for students to come back and uh, do face-to-face -face learning. But uh, there are certain policies that needs to be followed, uh, safety, safety measures that needs to be implemented. So what's happening right now is that there might be an instance that maybe 50, just like uh, Albert was uh, mentioning earlier, there might be some instance that 50% of the students will be in the classroom, actual in the classroom, but 50% are doing it online. And there might be an instance that they are going to schedule it, 50, this, those 50% who are in the classroom, the other day would, they would be the ones who would be online and vice versa. So I think that would be that that is one thing that we're going into as long as uh, there's already a proper uh, and stable internet connection for all. Because if that if we're going to do that most most often than not in the hybrid mode, there should be a stable connection so that the people who are in their respective homes or students who are in their respective homes uh, listening to synchronous classes for that matter should be able to cope or to catch up with some of the lessons that are being delivered during the face-to-face -face classes. So I think uh, that's the direction that we're going in. Thank you, Edmund. That's a great observation. In fact, in fact, the other day that I was, um, uh, my, my kid was finally going to back to physical school. I was like, you don't have a runny nose, do you? I mean, like, in the past, when a kid has a runny nose, you would still send them to school, right? I mean, but now you can't do that because it's, you know, uh, 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 but then he will completely miss out of school. How do we manage that I mean, with, with hybrid situation would be, would be really interesting. Felicia, you can unmute yourself as well. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Oh, okay. So good afternoon from Indonesia. My name is Felicia. Uh, I'm originally from Indonesia, so uh, I noticed that uh, most speakers are concerned about people living in a remote area where they they cannot access uh, internet connection. But I want to give you an illustration. Uh, what if uh, I live in a certain countries where certain Online plat platforms are, are restricted or prohibited by the laws and regulations. So how do we uphold 
fair treatment toward those living in that country, where I guess they are not the governments are not bound by the principles we embrace in this uh, digital digital era. So maybe I would like to address these questions to uh, anyone who wants to answer. So yeah, maybe that's my questions. Thank you. Aris, I see you have your hand up. Go okay. Ahead. Uh, yeah, I'll just answer Felicia's question. So I think that's one of the things that uh, why uh, the country right now have decided to to implement a module type of, of learning. It's mostly synchronous, uh, asynchronous for that matter, but uh, it's not really online, but really offline. Uh, teachers pre prepare modules for those modules, actual modules, hard copy modules, which these modules would be delivered directly to the doorstep of the students. And that is a module that is for, for example, a one week or a two week uh, coverage of lessons. So that's that's a very crude way of doing it, but just to be able to integrate this this particular students who are having problems uh, connecting to the connecting online. So I think that is one way to look at it. Uh, we're or we're still in the infant stages, so uh, I think that's one way and one alternative that we can look into. Thank you, Edna. Thank you, Felicia, for your question. No, that's that's certainly a, a, a big problem, and you know the digital digital divide issue. Um, and I see it uh, was discussed in the chat as well. Any others who want to um, add to this? Albert, I saw you added something. Uh, Rilla, please. Um, maybe for me, uh, like for from technical sites, it's the first is depend on the region itself, but the second is even if we cannot access like, uh, you know, the global network, we can set up the local networks. So especially like, we can see that it's more like uh, we we have to uh, upload the online learning system itself to the local network. If, if, if the problem is we cannot access the internet, like global internet, so maybe that's the alternatives from the technical side. Thank you. Thank you, Rila. Um, oh, Don, please. Uh, yeah, ahead. just quickly, um, what echoing what um, Aris mentioned. So in the Philippines, what they're doing is um, um, for students who don't have access to the internet, um, they have an option of um, bringing in some physical modules. So in fact, the future may not be online for these people, but it's more or less outsourcing the teaching to the parents. So that would have some different issues th in themselves. But um, maybe, you know, that's also one way for us to think about what the future will be. Perhaps it may not be online for it may not be an online solution that would be appropriate for all settings. And if the idea is to leave no one behind, uh, we should be open um, to these different types of approach, whether using um, technology, which is great, but in instances where technology may not be appropriate, then and uh, adopting these kinds of um, offline um, crude methods might be appropriate for that particular setting too. Oh, but I, I see that you added some uh, earlier in the chat about what Hong Kong is doing. I wonder if you want to bring it um, uh, uh, in, in, in voice as well. Okay. I think uh, uh, the situation right now for Hong Kong is much better because the number of cases found that for every day seems uh, uh, decreased a lot. But um, all the evidence show that the, the COVID-19 will be coming again. So I think uh, we need to take a good chance to no matter we teach the, or prepare for the futures, okay? Once the COVID-19 is coming again, no matter where it is, okay, we should be able to uh, solve all the problems that now we are facing because the, the cases, the class suspension before is so sudden. Uh, so that we have digital gap or the learning gap, but we need to, we, have, we should have the responsibility to prevent it to, happen, to be happen again. Thank you. Um, seeing no no hands up and no question, I, if I've missed any question um, from the chat, please alert me to it. Um, I'll I'll go back to the 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 because uh, we're running out of time as well, and I'll go back to the the speakers and and kind of ask one question: Is um, 
we we know that COVID is going to come back, but let's say we get over it, which eventually we will with the, with the vaccine and everything. Uh, we should be able to go over it. So, what is the ideal um, learning experience uh, into the future? Uh, if you can have anything you want, just say a, a one or one or two sentence. Uh, I I see a hand up, but just one or two sentence on that. I'll go to the hand and we'll wrap there. Anyone thoughts? What's your ideal world for education combining IT and um, you know the classroom learning? Don. Uh I'll just be very quick, um, but um, it should embrace, I, I know this is very generic, but it should embrace the um, specifics of um, inclusivity and accessibility. So as long as um, education using technology embraces principles of um, accessibility, um, technology-wise and all these things, and inclusivity, I think we should be moving in the right direction. Anyone else? Aris? Yeah, uh, for me, uh people should be adapted as much as possible. And uh, adaptation would really bring about a lot of changes. And we all know that it's already been changing, but uh, adaptability is really a key for us to be able to go on with this. And not only that, uh, maybe you need to be open-minded of all of the things that have been, <laughs> have been happening around because uh, being open-minded uh, really is, I think it would spark, spark something for for these people to really have an idea in order for us to be able to have this implementation and so on and so forth. So yeah, I think uh, adaptability and open-mindedness. Thank you, Iris. I, two, two, I see two hands up. I will go to them quickly and then give it to, to Albert and Rila to, to, to wrap. Uh, Swaran? Um, hi, I just wanted to, to share something. Um, so I teach at Fiji National University and uh, we mostly engaged into training of, um, you know, ICT related courses. Um, that's my department in particular. And um, there is one course in particular that we teach, Diploma in IT, which specializes in network engineering. So the first semester is already a challenge. And I think it, it's really no news that um, inclusion in STEM subjects is already a challenge, especially in developing and underdeveloped uh, countries. Now, um, an experience that we had is when we, when, when um, uh, COVID-19 hit us, now for a small island country, it was a very big issue for us, right? But um, we had some students who went back to the islands. Now, you may know that Fiji is, uh, well, comprises of more than 300 islands and some of them are in remote places. So some of our students went back to um, their villages and as it is, they had uh, accessibility, uh, issues in in, uh, in the remote islands wherever they were based. So some of them came back. Uh, we, we tried to use a multi- i have to ask you to keep it short because we have only two minutes left. Okay. So what we did was uh, we used uh, all different types of mechanisms, including a YouTube channel, but simulation software didn't really work well for us. So uh, we needed to have one extra month where we just taught our students the practical items again. Um, is there anyone who can share the experiences in, in teaching STEM subjects in particular? Because TV subjects, they, I believe they're a little easier to teach uh, when, when you have, you know, uh, internet access. But STEM subjects is a real big issue. Is there anyone who could, who, you know, some, shed some light on that? I'll, I'll come to the speakers, but I'll go to Bernard first. Uh, that's very interesting because my kids get a, 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 like a kit sent to them every, you know, couple of weeks. But uh, Bernard? Uh, I won't uh, take it long. I've been at Boston here from Nepal. Uh, so my concluding remark would be uh, for future education, technology accommodating uh, personalized learning needs of every student would be the way forward for the future. I think, thank you. That would be a great way to end our session, but uh, I will um, see if anyone wanted to to respond further to the STEM, you know, uh, especially, I guess, maybe Albert, uh, you, you might have some some thoughts on what, you know, how teachers deal with STEM and when you talk about uh, uh, remote learning. Okay, I took a response to the STEM and also I took a wrap, wrap, wrap up for myself, okay. I think for Hong Kong, for teaching the STEM, uh, what we can do is we, we, we just like Emma said, we courier the, the STEM kids to the kids at home so that they can have practically, they have the, the things to do. Uh, but even though it also depends on the internet, 
for the tutor to guide them. Otherwise, simply send the kids, uh, send the things to the kids is of no use. Um, and so for my wrap up is exactly the same. For Hong Kong, uh, we are lucky that we can have uh, good accessibility devices, etc. But what we cannot solve right now is about how to teach the practical lessons, for example, physics, chemistry, biology, and even those STEM subjects. Uh, up to now, we can't find any good solution. And so we are highly expecting uh, some business partner to develop solutions for them. And I think that is a, a, a good chances for business to do their work. Thank you, Albert. Any last words, Rila? Mm, yeah, for me, maybe uh, just the main point of ICD is to make an easier life, right? But we also have to understand the equity. So better to know and listen to what students and institutions need. For example, like the medical students and elementary students have a different treatment. Like elementary students, maybe we have to gamification the learning system. But for medical students, it's different. So the equity is the best thing I think. I think. Thank you. Thank you, Rila. And um, I, I'll wrap with this. Uh, and uh, hope I, I, you know, I challenge everyone here that in two to three years, let's try to have this session again. And I hope we won't go back to the same old. Uh, but I am not totally optimistic. Uh, but I think everyone needs to contribute to to keep this momentum. And I think IT can be the the uh, level uh, you know level the playing field for for more. Uh, students than, than less, although there are, of course, all those issues. Thank you, everyone. I overran for a little bit, um, but um, thank you, everyone, for joining, and see you. Bye.